Covered Insurance, October is well underway, and so is registration for InsureTech Connect in Vegas for 2023. In case you haven't heard, Awkward Insurance listeners interested in going to ITC Vegas 2023 can still get $200 off their registration by using code AWKWARDVEGAS, in all caps, AWKWARDVEGAS, at vegas.insuretechconnect.com forward slash register. This code is good through the month of October 2023 until registration closes. But I'm so happy to be back today. I've had a long week with college students in Baltimore, Maryland. That was so much fun. GIS is a conference that I look forward to every single year to talk to the college students and see their bright, shining faces and eagerness to get involved within the industry. So I'm so happy to sit here at my desk once again. It was so exhausting. Ashley, how are you? Is there anything new or exciting coming up as we head into the fourth quarter of 2023? Yeah, I mean, I think what's new and exciting is this conversation that we're about to have with Chris Green, and I'm just holding back all of the comments that I want to say about flood insurance. So go ahead and do his intro so I could stop sitting here biting my tongue. (laughs) So yes, we have Chris Green, aka the Flood Guru on our podcast today. Super excited. Flood is always a hot topic to talk about, one that I don't think is really talked about enough. So I'll just let Chris introduce himself. Chris, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great, but we're more interested in you. (laughs) Where are you from, Chris? I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up in uh, between Birmingham and South Georgia. I tell people that my dad was Homer Simpson without the personality. So my dad helped manage nuclear power plants. So we moved around a little bit. So I come from a family of engineers. Ah. Okay. Actually, how I ended up getting my master's degree is the college I went to was destroying chemical weapons. And so they had to have this massive disaster management department. And so I learned all about destroying weapons of mass destruction and everything when I worked on my master's degree in emergency management with a focus on flood and hazard mitigation. That sounds well, that's, really interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like a separate podcast in and of itself, because that's pretty awesome. Well, I was actually, I was supposed to do uh, weapons of mass destruction. I wanted to work in the Middle East uh, over there on that kind of stuff. But uh, the day I started my master's degree, Hurricane Katrina hit, and I ended up studying Hurricane Katrina for two and a half years. And I studied every flood from the bottom of the Mississippi to the top of the Mississippi, water tables, all that different stuff. And so that's kind of just how it kind of naturally happened. And thus, the flood guru was born. Actually, I wasn't even born on that. I bought a house in a flood zone about 10 years ago and was told the premiums were going to be $3,000 when they should have been $300. The real estate company didn't know what they were doing. The insurance company didn't even know what they were doing. I went to the mortgage company and said, hey, there's nothing we can do. And I actually showed all three how to take that $3,000 rate, turn it into a $300 rate. And I've been helping property owners do the exact same thing for the last 12 years. Where were you buying a property at? In Atlanta, Georgia. And then somehow you turned that into this. That's crazy. And so I took that same experience. And actually, I also did a flood zone change on that property, which I've also been helping property owners do for the last 12 years with our flood consulting company. You know, this is really where I believe that, you know, for good or for bad, the word expert, but passion is truly born is when you yourself have actually experienced something and you know how to connect to it and you know how to process the information that comes out of it and spill it back out to other people. And I can just see, just based off that one scenario, that that's, I mean, that's exactly where the passion of doing what you do comes from instead of just being like, yeah, I got into flood because it's super easy to sell. I heard that as it came out of my mouth. (laughs) That's a condition when we hire somebody, they had to have had some kind of experience with flood. Maybe it was a family member, maybe it was themselves, something they'd been through that they can kind of walk customers through that story. Uh, Hey, I've been there. You know, I I know how you feel. And here are the questions I wish I knew how to ask. Have you had a personal experience with Flood, Ashley? No, as he was saying that, I'm thinking, well, first, I wouldn't get hired by his company. But second, my personal experience, which is why I'm excited to talk to you, is, you know, I came from an area. And I know you'll say is that everyone is technically in a flood zone, which, you know, took a long time for me to learn. You just might be in a very good flood zone where you're not ever going to get hit. Right. But we had a lady one time and she was taking out like a reverse mortgage. She was like 80 years old and taking out a reverse mortgage on her home. And we had to do some, I had to rewrite her insurance policy or something. And she's like, they're telling me I'm in a flood zone. And I know our hometown very well. I'm like, okay, where do you live? Please enlighten me. So I go and I actually visually inspect her house and she lives on this hill And the mountain goes down to something like I would never walk down it. It was way too steep. 
And there was like a little creek running through it. And I'm like, this is the flood zone. And it was going to be very expensive for her insurance and for the flood policy. And I'm like, I don't know enough about this because we never deal with flood insurance in the area that I had lived in. And I feel so bad for this lady who doesn't have money to begin with is taking out the reverse mortgage and she's going to have to use this to pay for her flood policy. So it's just, I could have used you then, Chris, 10 years ago. Where were you? That's actually exactly why so much of our business comes from insurance agents in that exact situation. Like, look, I don't deal with it enough to feel comfortable with it, but also, A, don't want to lose a customer. I want to look like the expert, but I also want to help. And that's what I asked them. Like, well, you know, what do you mean you don't do much on the coast? I said, no, inland flooding is our focus. The education's not there. The resources aren't there. And that's our goal to bring two of both of those there so agents have what they need to do their job. Yeah. Before yeah. we go any further, did you say crick or creek? It depends on the context I'm using. I said crick. In this one, I said crick. <laughs> you did? <laughs> yeah. It was just a little crick. A creek is a little bit bigger than a crick. <laughs> I knew that the word crick was out there, but I didn't know that people actually used it. <laughs> But when I jumped on, you guys were saying something about a flood in New York. What is that? Because I've had my head in the sand, apparently. And... Oh, so on Friday, we had a massive flood in New York. They get seven inches of rain in 24 hours, and it caused flash flooding. Like The subway filled with water. Literally every single piece of transportation was shut down in New York. Property owners, some of them are going to end up losing everything. Business owners are going to lose everything because none of them were in a high-risk flood zone. It was all low-risk area. But this is actually one reason why so many private companies have started to pull out of New York is New York is not addressing the mitigation issue properly. So they're not willing to mitigate some of these drainage systems and the private companies are like, look, we're pulling back because the city's not willing to take the efforts to reduce the risk. And we just can't take that exposure with what's happening with reinsurance cost. Hmm. Can you imagine being on the subway or being down there waiting on the subway and seeing water shooting out of the side of the wall? That is one of my biggest fears. I can because I helped. Pulled my dad out of a flooded vehicle when I was about nine years old uh, from a flash flood that happened in our neighborhood. How many other ways are you tied to flood, Chris? Holy cow. The only thing I haven't experienced on flood, thankfully, is actually a flood insurance claim. Yourself. You've not experienced a flood insurance claim yourself, but you've obviously helped others through their flood insurance claims. We handle about 2,000 flood claims a year. Oh my gosh, that sounds like a nightmare to be perfectly honest with you. I got deeply engrossed in one flood claim and I never wanted to do it again. <laughs> I was so happy that Brown and Brown or that Wright National Flood was uh, part of Brown and Brown for that one. I had somebody there to help me through it. So Wright actually reaches out to us. We kind of partner together and they're like, hey, people aren't listening to this. Will you put a video out on this? Because they're like, you're a third party and maybe people will listen to you more. And we do vice versa a lot. And so we kind of push content back and forth between each other on flood. So let me just start with, let me start with a question. You haven't always been the flood guru. So can you think back to when you first started in insurance and that very first flood inquiry that came in, what that was like for you? I think, Ashley, you just spoke on yours about the older woman and having a reverse mortgage. So I walked over to our CSR who had been with the company for 30 years and asked her about this flood quote. And she sends me over to this DOS system. I mean, this is like using a T chart. <laughs> Those are still active. And she's like, Today. this is how you do it. I said, it shouldn't be this complicated. Oh, and this is what it's going to be. The rate's going to be this. And so that was really the time I'd run into it when I was working for Liberty Mutual until I experienced it myself. And that's when I discovered, hey, there's a major gap in education here for real estate agents, insurance agents, loan officers, even property owners. It's causing people to lose deal. It's causing people not to be able to get their dream homes, but it's also causing people not to know what the real risk is on a property of zero to a hundred. Hey, I understand what flood zone I'm in. What are the actual chances of this thing flooding? Where's that flooding coming from? Is it coming from the coast? Is it coming from a retention pond that somebody put in my neighborhood? Or is it coming from a terrible drainage system in my city? Mm. Which is one of the reasons why I built the flood risk assessment tool on our website where people can put that information in and it gives them that information immediately. And they immediately know what their flood risk is if they're looking at a property or they already own it to help them understand and become aware that flooding can be a problem for them, even if they've never personally experienced it. Mm -hmm. I had a flooding situation once with a client. They didn't have a flood policy, but uh, it was a backup that was caused by uh, torrential rains that, you know, came in first, but it was around election season and the signs were backing up the storm drains. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
So even though they weren't in a flood zone, didn't have a flood policy, it was caused because of the massive, you know, sudden downpour of everything and the streets just couldn't drain it fast enough because there were signs backing up those storm drains. And that's honestly where the majority of flooding is coming from. Uh, Birmingham, Alabama, a couple of years ago, where I grew up, we had 13 inches of rain in four hours. Uh, mm -hmm. We did 82 home rescues in two hours in uh, Pelham, Alabama. Uh, Waverly, Tennessee, we had 17 inches of rain in 24 hours. St. Louis, Missouri, we had 13 inches of rain in four hours. In fact, we had an investor there we had recommended higher coverage to. And he's like, no, I'm only going to take what the bank wants. And so now we've been helping him actually get a disaster loan on top of his insurance for about $2 million to get these buildings back up and running again. Hmm. I have a dumb question. Keep in mind, like I love, I love insurance. I love like home, auto, all of those things. But when it comes to flood, I don't understand any of it. And it was painful trying to write the very few policies I had to write. <laughs> so when you say that, like, um, for like, for instance, a community with the drainage system, I can think of a community four miles from my house that is known for any time it rains, we all joke like, all right, there's going to be a foot of water in that basement. Now, everybody always says that this town floods. However, I at least know the definition of flood. And while I've never experienced it, I have a feeling it's more of like, water back up through their basement, but I'm not positive. It could very well be flooding. How is that determined? Like if, if I'm in a flood zone because my drainage system is bad, is that determined because after, you know, five years of everybody's house consistently flooding, they decide, okay, you are now a flood zone because the drainage system is terrible. So what you're talking about is basically the flood mapping process, uh, but generally take, can take up to five years. So, and I'm actually doing an interview with a Roanoke news station tomorrow on this because they recently had this happen where, hey, we've, we've done all these changes to the river. We went to FEMA, we got these things approved. So the new flood maps are going into place. Well, generally when this happens, it's like you say, a flooding event happens. So when a flooding event happens, then they come in and do what's called a flood insurance study report, which takes about 18 months. Hey, why did this happen? What could have we done to change it? So if some of these properties been in a required area, non-required area. So they go through about 18 months, collect all that data. Then they go back to local community and FEMA said, all right, this is the data we've collected. Okay, these are the areas we need to change. So they go back and forth for a while and agree, hey, here are the new flood maps. At this point, you're probably at year three, three and a half. So then there's preliminary maps going into place for about a year. They start educating the public on what's going to happen. And generally, they go live after that. But it could be that something changes last second, which is exactly what happened in Houston before Harvey. They went back and forth for almost 20 years, tried disagreeing on a flood map. Had that flood map been in place, 85% of the people who didn't have flood insurance during Harvey would have had it. Wow. And so that's why people tell, tell people on these flood zones and these flood maps, think about it. If it takes five years for that to happen, imagine how a risk changes over five years. Immediately, it's out of date. Another example I would use is the California, Tennessee, with all the wildfires. When a wildfire happens, it immediately creates a flood exposure because all the vegetation's gone. So you mm -hmm. don't have anything to soak up that water anymore. Now it becomes a runoff, mud flows, mudslides. And so it may take five years for FEMA to update it, but it doesn't mean it's not going to take five years for your property now to flood. Man. Yeah. That's crazy. What I always tell people is that floods and in-laws have a lot in common. They show up at your door <laughs> uninvited and they show up at the worst time. Oh my goodness. So a lot of what you were talking about was kind of like on a grander scale and larger, um, larger geographic region. It just, it made me remember. It's so weird how you've got memories that just like come up all of a sudden that you forgot you even had. Another client of mine, they had a creek, a, a creek, <laughs> but a neighbor, if you will, upstream decided that he wanted to build a dam on his side of it. And it diverted that water to where it did not flow in the same you know, direction or areas anymore and suddenly created. Unfortunately, because of the definition of flood, you, what happened to his property didn't actually qualify for flood because it didn't inundate the right amount of property for it to qualify as flood since it didn't. You yeah, know, but, uh, pass through two or more properties. It was just his property. The other guy should have been liable. Liable. Yes, he did violate a rule. Yeah, yes. So what happens when we're doing flood zone changes and we're working with people on redirected water, what you're talking about is what's called an encroachment review. That means it cannot have a negative impact on somebody else downstream. If it does, it can't be put in place and the local floodplain manager has to sign off on it if anything like that's being done. But let's do a hypothetical. You live in northeastern Pennsylvania where all of the words that you just said don't exist there because people don't go and get approval to do stuff. So let's say <laughs> the neighbor up the road from me decides to go and 
put in a dam in their creek because they just want to. And then it diverts and hits my property. And I don't have flood insurance because I'm not in a flood zone where I needed it. Dustin, this is more for you then. Wouldn't that homeowner be liable regardless? Because flood doesn't... They, they, could, they very well could be. Oh, yeah. No, I definitely feel like they would be. They could also be in what's called a 1316 violation then, which is basically a floodplain management uh, violation. Now, typically, these happen on properties that are substantially damaged or substantially improved. We see this a lot where an investor will come in and add an addition to a property. He gets ready to sell it, and he can't get a permit. Um, the reason is when he added that addition, if that house was built in 1950, according to floodplain management guidelines, it's actually built in 2023 now, which means the base flood elevation could be six feet higher. Now he's got to raise the property eight feet, and it's going to cost him 100 grand to do it. But we see these violations happen all the time where people are being required to fill in their basements, even though the house was never flooded because they did some kind of improvement or something that changed the year built according to FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program regulations, where now they have to make these changes. In fact, I had one in Ohio where the customer had to fill in his entire basement with either sand or cement, or they were going to continue to put tax liens on the property. Good grief. Do you know where in Ohio that was? No, I've got to go back and look. It's been two or three said, years. I bet it's the town that I was just referring to. <laughs> <laughs> and this right here is why you need somebody like Chris on your side to help you through all this stuff because he has just spewed out more information <laughs> about flood than I think I've ever heard in my entire career. Holy cow. And not only that, yeah, but it's but the, fascinating, right? But then the NFIP has just recently gone through changes that have changed everything we knew about flood products. Okay. I want to do something fun. Chris is our insurance guru. He's, he's the agent. Ashley and I are the consumer. And Ashley, I know you've got some of these in your bank. So if you need to take a minute to think about it and write it down really quick, I'm going to give you some of like the most common customer one-liners as to why they won't buy flood or when you offer them flood, what they say back. And I want Chris to give us from the agent's perspective, like a one or two liner that the agent should use to overcome that. Does that make sense? Yes. So like the very first one, we said it, we said it already. I live at the top of the hill. I don't need flood insurance. What's a line that an insurance agent could use to begin to change that consumer's perspective? I live at the top of the hill. I don't need insurance. You know what? You're probably right. You do not need flood insurance, but you're going to want it when that city sewer system backs up as a result of a flood somewhere else. I like it. Ashley, do you have one? I mean, I feel like that was, I feel like anything that I'm going to say is I don't need it for X, Y, Z reason. My property hasn't flooded since I've owned it. Why do I need it now? That's going to be the same answer though. Well, no, in that, in that situation, what I do is I say, you're right. It has never flooded. You are very fortunate. But what happens when it does? What is finance? Let's just take a look. What is financial loss going to look like for you? If you did not have insurance in place, would you need help replacing your building? Would you need help replacing your contents? Can you imagine coming up with roughly $300,000 on your own? Could it take you 10 years of financial? Are we talking about bankruptcy here? Are we talking about having you use your children's college tuition to get back up on your feet? What is that going to do to them financially in the, in the future? When simply this policy here could help protect this, because as we see with climate change and severe weather pattern changes, it's happening across the whole country. Okay, I got another one. If I have a flood, FEMA will give me money. You're right. They very well may give you money. Now let's talk about this. During Hurricane Harvey, the average insurance payout was $100,000. The average disaster assistance was $4,000. The only way disaster assistance is going to pay out if there's a presidential disaster declaration, Arizona has more floods than any state every year. A lot of those floods do not go reported. And the majority of those floods do not have a presidential disaster direct declaration, which means people have nothing. Okay, everybody listening to this episode, even if you and your agency have absolutely nothing to do with flood insurance and you very, very rarely deal with it, what you need to take away from the last four minutes of conversation is that every time Chris shut us down, he started with the positive and said, you're right, or you're very fortunate, or absolutely, it may not. And then he told us why we still needed it. So there is your one takeaway if you don't deal with flood at all. I have one more. My mortgage company doesn't require it. I don't need to buy it. You're right. Your mortgage company doesn't require it. You know what else they don't require? They also don't require you to put replacement costs on your property. They're only worried about the loan amount. You could also take out flood insurance with the mortgage company where they force place it. And guess what they're worried about? The loan. They're not worried about making you whole again. 
what's going to happen when your $450,000 house only has $200,000 in coverage because that's what the bank required. You're going to have to go get an SBA disaster loan for $250,000 for the next 30 years, pay for something that you're not even in. Trust me, I know we had it happen to a client who is still paying for a lake house 10 years later that he doesn't have. Ashley, do you have flood insurance? <laughs> you just bought a house. I know we don't. You just we bought don't a have house. flood insurance. Ashley, do you have flood no, insurance? No, I looked at the flood maps. We're in like I know, I know. You're right. It's not likely to happen, <laughs> but it might happen because the drainage system. So let me tell you. Let me tell you the likelihood of my house flooding from a river or stream <laughs> is extremely low. Do you know? However, do you know where it would more than likely flood? Is from the swimming pool I installed in the backyard because it's elevated a little bit. If it overflows, it's coming straight into my house. The problem is it's not going to cover my house unless it also impacts someone else's property. So I need to make sure I dig a ditch going down to the neighbor's house. <laughs> Wait, so we had a claim oh like that. God. I mean, it wasn't didn't end up being a claim because it wasn't flooding, but it was somebody's pool. But what's what's the ruling? Because I've been out of the game for too long. How many houses does it have to affect? Being on private, look at it differently. We had some claims covered in Texas because it actually did impact two different properties. Oh. Now, what most people don't realize is technically it doesn't have to be, it has to be your property. It could be something sometimes as simple as a city street flooding as well. Yeah. Because it's another parcel. It's two or more properties, not two or more residences or buildings or whatever. Two or more properties. Two acres or two properties. The whole reason for the two acres was like if you're in a rural state and you live on a farm, there may not be another property impacted. but I thought it was more than two properties. That's why I was confused. I thought it was like four or five. Well, it'll say two properties or more, but the, we've seen it where it pays out, where even a city street, because they consider it to be a different parcel. But we've also seen it where it has to be two properties. I mean, honestly, it goes back to the adjuster and how the adjuster is looking at the verbiage. So Chris, after this, I'm going to need you to call Ashley so that she can purchase her first flood insurance policy. Yeah, might as well. <laughs> Hey, the best one, the best one we get is, hey, I'm in a condo. I don't need it. It's covered by our master policy. You're right. It, it is. But what they're not covering is your personal belongings. Exactly. Yeah. I've, you know, one of the perspectives that I've always loved in terms of like a super fallback, you've already gone through all these other explanations. Well, the grandfathering, you purchase the flood insurance policy now when you're not in a significantly impacted flood zone. And then once, like if anything ever does happen, say it's development of the community around you has now impacted and now you are in a flood zone, you've had the policy, your pricing is not going to be the same as it was if you were buying that policy brand new after the remapping. So the grandfathering actually no longer exists. A couple of years ago, I actually shot a video dressed as a grandfather oh, no. discussing the grandfathering rule. Like I had a gray beard, everything on my YouTube channel. The grandfather no longer exists. So I actually grandfathered my own policy on a personal house. While grandfathering does not exist anymore, what does exist is something called glide path. And this means that we can transfer our current policy from one owner to the next. What are the benefits of that? Let's talk about that real quick. Let's just say Ashley goes in and gets her new flood insurance policy today, and it's $4,000. But let's say that she had a policy through FEMA for the last four years before risk rating 2.8 came out, and that rate was like $600, and it keeps increasing each year. What happens, you have something called four-risk premium. Forest premium is what she's being charged today on a new policy. Glide Pass says that FEMA can only charge you 18% more each year until you get there. That means it may take you 15 years to get there, which can be the benefit of this. And this is very similar to what grandfathering probably was mm -hmm. as you continue to transfer this policy. We recently had a customer who had the flood insurance through the military company and they were selling their property and they were going to be charged $4,000 a year, but we were actually able to use that other insurance policy, the policy number, to put it in where they were at least only charged 18% more than what the current property owner was paying, which was $900, not $4,000. And we could explain to them, look, here's where you're headed. Here's what's going to happen in the next three, four, five years. But this is what you're getting today. Mm. And that's what I work with our team. I say, look, we use full risk premium. That full risk premium is also going to change every year with FEMA because of the way they're changing risk. But this is a way for us to explain to consumers what's going to happen every year to you through year four. When you buy this house, you do not want to be broke the next year. And this is a way for us to kind of forecast this and show people this. Good gracious, this man is full of a bunch of knowledge. Are you, do you feel like you're <laughs> drowning in information about money? Yes, I do. <laughs> and I just want to tell people, oh, why don't you offer home insurance? Why don't you offer, not to be me, we don't have time. And we're so deep in flood. Yeah. We can't. It takes away from us truly understanding the NFIP manual that we study every week, the claims manual, all the different policy forms on the private side. 
He said he studies the NFIP manual every week. Is it like a book club? You pull out one closet at a time? <laughs> I, actually, I do with our team, and I, I give them a quiz on it, and I test them on GlidePath and all these different things of the manual. I actually even had our VA team build eBooks on the manuals so we can actually share them with people on our website. Hey, this is a 40-page document. What are the five most important things you need to know as a consumer? I love it. I love it. Oh, my gosh. So in, in light of ITC coming up and all the other tech advances that are going on, is there anything in flood insurance or within that sector of things that you're looking forward to or are they particularly exciting or promising when it comes to tech and ins- or tech and flood? Yeah, so we actually built a flood risk assessment tool on our website a couple of years ago that I've kind of been testing out. We keep getting deeper and deeper. And like if Ashley went to put her address in, it's going to say zero from 100. What are the chances of my property flooding? How close to water am I? And then it's also even going to tell you what estimated premium is. Is that estimated premium way over estimated? Yes, for a reason. We'd rather be conservative there. But the whole point was, whether you're a homeowner or you're a real estate agent, your job's not nine to five, and neither should be the information you need to determine the risk of a property. So we wanted people to understand that, yeah, I may not be required to get this, but what's at risk? Yeah. What do you think about parametric coverage? That's been something that's been a really hot topic. The guys at Flood Flash are good friends of mine. Parametric is big. Uh, we've been working with them a lot down the road of getting mortgage companies to accept it because, of course, they don't accept it right. right now because of how claims pay out. But from a business owner standpoint, parametric is huge. One reason is if you stack on top of an NFIP policy, you never have to file those claims against the NFIP policy. Now the claims variable doesn't come in and have a negative impact on your NFIP policy when they do that 10-year look back because you're using parametric to pay out, not NFIP. Mm, good point. I like that. So, Parametric can really be used in a great way to help protect the NFIP. So in combination with not in place of is basically what you're saying. I like it. Wow. There is so much information here. I hesitate to keep going for, you know, just really flooding (laughs) everybody's brain with too much information. I think this is a great place to stop. And I think, honestly, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this myself at least three or four times and pick out different parts to really understand everything that you've said. Holy cow. Ashley, do you have anything in closing or summary? Or I don't even know what to think right now. No, honestly, my brain is going in like 10 different directions. And it honestly keeps going back to imagining being down in the subway when the water's coming through the walls. So (laughs) (laughs) you know what? that goes back to a conversation I have with my team. When we send a follow-up, I got an email sent out from one of my team members. And it honestly, it made me throw up in in my mouth. And it said, I have so-and-so with the flood insurance guru want to follow up on that quote proposal last week and see if you have any questions. And I was like, what do you mean if they have any questions? You know, we're the expert. They have no idea what to ask. You just overwhelm their human brain. Instead, what you should have said, hey, I've been there. You know, our owner bought a house on flood zone 12 years ago. Here are some questions he wished he would have asked. Here are questions that people like yourself in your situation have every day. And here is a link that has some of those questions answered for you. Now we're telling them what questions they should be asking. They have no idea what to ask. Like someone yeah. said to us, that you're the expert, not me. And we need to act that way as insurance agents. They don't know what to ask. We need to tell them, hey, here are some things that other people are asking. Hey, so in light of that, earlier you said that um, you get with your team and you uh, quiz them on the top five things that a consumer needs to know. It, in closing, let's do top three things an insurance professional should be should either know or should be educating their client on. Everybody's in a flood zone. Number one, everybody's in a flood zone. Everybody's in a flood zone. It doesn't matter if you're in what's called low risk, high risk, whatever. Flood zones no longer determine flood insurance rates with the National Flood Insurance Program, but they still do with some private companies. That number two? That's number two. Number three is probably one thing that most insurance agents don't think about is compared to a traditional home insurance policy, not on the coast, but inland, you may have a deductible for $1,000. You have a fire, your belongings get replaced, your building gets replaced. Well, flood... You have two different deductibles, possibly three in private. So if you go with a $5,000 deductible, you could potentially have a $15,000 deductible. I like that you brought that one up. I think that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions. And I think that's kind of, there's a lot of things that lead to some of those misconceptions across all sorts of different policies and the way deductibles are applied. And I don't think the flood deductible is talked about enough. Here's the bonus one. NFIP does not offer replacement cost on content. Right. Yep. That's bonus. That's number four. Thank you so much for your time here today with us, Chris. If somebody wants to get in contact with you to try and find out how to untangle even more flood knowledge, how can they do that? 
You can visit our website, floodinsuranceguru.com. Uh, I've actually got our new learning center for insurance agents uh, coming out October 15th, where it is just a learning center for insurance agents. Nobody else. Love it. Then uh, you can also find me on Facebook. I'm usually cooking something with a different grill, going back and forth with David Carruthers about who's probably got the better food or the better grill. And then you can also find me on LinkedIn or just email me, flood at floodinsuranceguru.com. All right, before we leave, I have one quick question for you. So I just went in and I did my flood risk verification. So I remember that flood zone X is like the best one to be in, correct? Yep. So then my next question is for the floods, uh, the flood zone score, is it from one to 100? Yes. Okay, so I got a 20. So I'm not like horrible. No. Okay. 20 is good, <laughs> which means that more than likely, because the flood insurance rates are really based more on that score, I means your flood insurance premium is less than 400 bucks a year. Okay, that makes me feel better because the screen said premium estimate a thousand or less, so I got nervous. And that's why we put a thousand or less. That's obviously. fair. We like to overestimate that there. Love it. I like it. Thanks so much for being here, Chris. Ashley, oh my gosh, you had a ton of insights on this today. I think this has been a truly interesting and myth busting, thought provoking conversation. Thanks so much. Toodles, everybody. Thanks for hanging out and listening to another Awkward Insurance Conversation. If you haven't already, be sure to join the Awkward Insurance Facebook community. We have an amazing group of people on there. And for more episodes, head over to the National Alliance website at scic.com. Now go forth and be awkward. Toodles. Mm, that's awkward. <laughs>